Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Co-op. Uh, and this morning, on this little chilly Thursday morning, we have Mr. Doug O'Brien on with us this morning. Good morning, Doug. Hey, good morning, Vernon. So good to be with you again. Great, great, great. I'm glad you've taken out time of your busy schedule to be with us, and we're going to talk about your busy schedule in this program but you are the president and CEO of the National Cooperative Business Association slash CLUSA, Cooperative League of the USA International. So we are going to talk to you today about your busy schedule and everything you've got going on over there at NCBA. But first, could you tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, what kind of education, and eventually how did you get into co-ops? Well, again, Vernon, it's it's great to be part of the conversation here on Everything Co-op. It's it's one of my favorite things to do. Always good to be with you, Vernon. So I I uh, I kind of got it from the ground, as uh, as we'd say uh, on a farm in Iowa where I grew up. I grew up in Dubuque County, Iowa, where we purchased a lot of our inputs. We got our electricity. Uh, we sold you know some of our corn through cooperatives. You know, as a as a kid, I'll admit I I didn't. I knew the name and I knew the brand, but I, I didn't really know what it meant. But I, I, I came to really uh, appreciate what cooperatives meant and mean to those rural communities and to communities across the country and urban and, and suburban as I went along. Um, I, w I went to school. I got a law degree in Iowa and uh, actually got another degree in, in ag and food law at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. And from there, I, I did ag and, and food policy for, for 10 or 15 years, where co-ops play such such a critical role in that sector and, um, and kind of got into the, the policy and the legal issues around cooperatives at that time, mostly in, in agriculture and rural cooperatives. But then along the way, I, I got back into academe at uh, Drake University and the University of Arkansas, and I started uh, starting to gain and study more about rural community economic development where cooperatives are so prominent in utilities, uh, particularly in electricity, but also in, in water and now in broadband and telecommunications. Cooperatives play a, a critical role in, in other ways uh, in rural places as well. I worked in the Senate Ag Committee, worked for a couple governors from the Middle West, and, um, and then ended up working in the Obama administration for the entirety of the eight years on rural development issues, and then um, and then eventually at the White House for the last couple of years, uh, worked with cooperatives a lot at that time. And, and when I kind of was done with my stint there, I was fortunate enough uh, to be able to to land at the Apex Association for All Cooperatives here in the United States, and that's NCBA Clusa. And so I've been here for seven years, and uh, six of those years I've been the president and CEO, and. You know, NCBA Clusa, I'll, I, mm -hmm. it, it has a mission. It's been around for 108 years. Its mission is to is to advance, protect, and develop cooperatives. And for about the last seven years, its vision has been to help more people use cooperatives to build a more inclusive economy. So it's just a fantastic job, uh, you know, given what cooperatives have meant and can mean to people here in the United States and across the world. And, and, um, and then I'll just finish up and say that, you know, we, we do advocacy and, and public awareness uh, and thought leadership here in the United States. But for over 70 years, we've been doing cooperative development in developing regions across the world. Uh, now, well over 80 countries in our history. Today, we're in about 17 or 18 countries with 22 or three projects. Helping farmers, helping women, helping young people use 
the cooperative values and the cooperative principles to empower themselves in society and in their economy. So I really like that you get to live this cooperative values and principles uh, in everything you do. You get to help people have better qualities of life and showing them this co-op model. It's, it's fascinating, which is the whole reason for this Everything Co-op show is to get people to understand about this model, to know about it first, and then to understand it because it's a great option, particularly to the capitalistic model, for everyday people. Okay, Doug O'Brien, your vision, the vision of NCBA is to get more people to use Mm co-ops. How are you going about doing that? Yeah, well... There's there's a lot of different ways we do it, and I'll, I'll just I'm, I'm going to mention the three primary ways: advocacy, number one; number two, development; and number three, public awareness. So on advocacy, that means working at the U.S. Congress in the federal agencies, whether that's the U.S. Department of Agriculture, or the Small Business Administration, or the Housing, Urban Development, other. So working with the federal policymakers so that they support people who are using cooperatives and that could mean dollars to pay uh, nonprofits who help people develop cooperatives it can mean making sure that loan programs are accessible to cooperatives it can mean you know as new programs come down the pike that cooperatives are are eligible or or preferred in these new Programs that have every, they might have everything to do from energy to, you know, to workforce training to, you know, to, uh, to building infrastructure. So we do advocacy, a fairly typical Washington DC kind of strategy, Mm -hmm. relationships and, and good ideas. We also do development. And I talked a bit about that. You know, we, we do development across the world and we do it here in the United States. We work with the cooperative development community here in the United States to uh, to help them, you know, get resources, to help them network and learn from each other. And then here in the United States, we also have a number of projects that resources from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, from some other places that help people develop cooperatives in the United States. And as I mentioned earlier, across the world. And then the last one's public awareness. I mean, it's great to do this work but if people as you as you said and you know one of the missions of of everything co-op if people don't know about cooperatives then how could we expect that they would choose this strategy which in in many cases it is the best strategy for both you know economic empowerment and building democratic institutions and uh it's a it's a business that that tends to be more viable and long-lasting the non cooperatives, we we know some of that literature and some of that proof. So that's that's how we go about our mission and vision. So economic empowerment is just more money. I mean people have more money to take to their bank to put in their pocketbook to pay their bills and have health and all of that. Health insurance, mm-hmm. take pay their doctor bills. And that that is so extremely important. That's one of the reasons that I I like to talk about co-ops. How do you get more and more people to know about it because it can benefit them? And I got, Doug, one of the things that besides this economic empowerment, which is extremely important, but I've come to, I've come to the conclusion there's something even more important than that. In a co-op, and this is, I was managing housing co-ops in the district, uh, low income co-ops mostly, mostly, on the boards were black women, uh, middle age, perhaps a high school education, but they made extremely good sound decisions. And they held everybody accountable, each other, make sure they pay their bills and follow the policies and rules. Me, the lawyer, the accountant, they held people account and made great decisions. And that's what was the first thing that I found that I fell in love with co-ops but that gave them voice, okay? And with voice, particular for, it's hard enough for African-American men to get voice in our, in our mm-hmm. 
world in the U.S., but women, whether they're black or white, it's hard for them to get voice. If they're in the boardroom or in a meeting, too often they're not listened to. And in a co-op, they're listened to. And when they get voice, they get self-esteem. And that self-esteem to me is more important than the money. Uh, people may <laughs> may argue with me about that. But that's what I have found is extremely important in this co-op world. Folks have voice. Folks get self-esteem, self-worth, which shows up in the family and in the community. Okay, so you all do development, advocacy, public awareness. You talked about your education, particularly law school. Did you get any training in law school, not the agriculture, the master's, but in law? Did you get any training in co-ops in law school? No, in the regular law school, in the regular JD program, none. And I took I took corporate law. I took, I forget, an, another, at least one other business course. And I had contracts and I had, you know, all the, just the basic law school curriculum. And there wasn't a peep about about this business model that, you know, that some folks think is kind of a marginal thing. It's not that, you know, established, but, and Vernon, you know these numbers, uh, one out of three people in the United States are members of cooperatives. The, the vast majority of those are members of their, of their bank, of their own consumer financial institution. They own it. They elect the board. And those are credit unions. Credit unions. 110 million, maybe, maybe 120 million people in this country own their own bank. In agriculture, it depends on depends on the on the sector, but in uh, a lot of sectors, over 50 percent of all that commodity, you know, comes through a farmer owned uh, food company, and uh, it's democratically controlled. In, in dairy, for instance, 80 percent of all dairy comes through farmer owned co ops. Um, I didn't know it was that high. Yeah, in dairy, yeah. and then you go you go across in um, you know in some of the other sectors like uh, grain and um, that it might be around fifty percent. You know, the biggest co-op in the country is CHS, which is a which is a, a huge cooperative in well, across the country now that started in the Midwest, a farmer-owned cooperative to to merchandise grain and also to so farmers could get together and purchase the inputs, their seeds, their fuel, etc. And then, and then the third sector you think of as, as really big is, is rural electric cooperatives. Uh, there's about 900 of those across the country that cover the vast majority of the geography and that serve well over 40 million people. And not only serve, but are owned and controlled by the people who use that utility. So going back to your point, it's, it's kind of a travesty that in the vast majority of law school curriculum, and for that matter, MBA curriculum. It wasn't in my MBA you know, curriculum at all. Yeah, basic business. That you've got this this business form that's at scale that really is is you know a really viable proven choice that has a lot of good literature behind it, and it's not brought out in the curriculum. And um, that's you know that's something that we that we work on all the time. It's trying to figure out how to to get that in there. But that that that's a we could spend the rest of the hour talking about why why that happens. But uh, but it's got to change. That's for sure. So I taught at, at Howard University for five years, and I took a curriculum back to the business school to teach about co-ops, and it got nowhere. Uh, I got my MBA from Stanford. I went there and talked to the dean a couple times, and mm -hmm. it got nowhere. It was, you know, just not interested. They don't seem to know about it. Or I was wondering, well, I don't want to get too much far into this, but I was wondering if they just get their funding from the capitalistic model and they don't have any time. Funding and research and everything has been down that road, and they don't want to look at any other models, no matter how important this model is. So we've just got to find another way of getting people trained uh, about the yeah. cooperative model. Now, I totally agree with you there, Vernon. I, I'll mention I'm really excited this uh this spring, I'm going to teach a course, a short course, one credit, you know, kind of three, four day course at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville in that master's program on cooperatives uh, in, the, in, in the food system and in and, uh, and agriculture. So and they, they've consistently had a course there. And there are examples, University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin, of course, um, and there's some other places. But they're but they are exceptions and they shouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So what do you like? most about your job 
Ooh, I like a lot of things about this job. It's uh, well, it's got to be the people. People who tend to be attracted to to the cooperative community, I think, are um, you know whether how how knowingly or not they tend to they tend to reflect or are uh, dedicated to the cooperative values. Of course, the shared cooperative values that's that's you know held by the International Cooperative Alliance, part of the cooperative identity of uh, mutual self-help, of democracy, of equality, of equity. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's people who both, who, who understand the value of community and also understand the, the value of individuals. And, you know, cooperatives are designed to, to hold those two things in tension in a really successful way. And, and those are the kind of people that once, once they stumble into the cooperative movement then those who hang around it uh, are the kind of people i like to be around stumble into it there's a gentleman uh, african-american gentleman in detroit mckinney uh brother and i was at the up and coming this past year and we were on a panel together and when you talked about the people it made me think of what he said he said that white folks in the co-op movement are not normal they're not normal in that you don't find the racism, you find people helping each other, caring for each other. And that gets me to the ethical values of co-ops, honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for others. And that's yeah. what you find in the co-op world. That's black, white, and indifferent. But he just he pointed that out as he was talking about them starting, and I think their, their food co-op, uh, Detroit People's Food Co-op, is going to open uh, either the first quarter or second quarter of this year, and they raised $22 million over 13 years to build a brand new building and have this food co-op and a community kitchen and a lot of other things they're going to have in there. But it's like the people. The people make the – and that's what I have found and really like. People like you and mm-hmm. Chuck Snyder and yeah. – we can just go down the list of, of all of these people that really care for other people and wanting to make sure that people improve, improve their conditions and do whatever they can to improve those conditions. Yep. Okay, so that's what you like best is the people in your work. I have it there are four types of co-ops, and you've mentioned three. You've mentioned consumer co-ops. That's when people that own the business and control the business are the people that buy the products and services. And that's the credit union. That's the rural electric co-ops, uh, housing co-ops. Those are all types of consumer co-ops. You've mentioned purchasing co-ops and you have a lot of farmers that come together and start a business so they can buy the products they need to produce whatever they're going to produce. And anybody could, could do that here in the district there's something called cpa community purchasing alliance and they were they were created for churches and uh schools charter schools nonprofits that they could buy things together and get a better quality product for a lower price and then you have a marketing co-op and you mention your family selling their corn to a marketing co-op somebody you know is going to buy it and you have people like Ocean Spray, uh, Cabot Creamery. There's all of these different uh, products. And when you said that 80% of dairy goes through these marketing marketing slash producer co-ops, that's, that's huge. And the one you hadn't mentioned bef- yet is worker co-ops. That's if it's owned and controlled by the employees, mm-hmm. then it's a worker co-op. And I had heard from Esteban Kelly, I think it is, in the worker co-op spirit that it was like somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of new worker co-ops are people of color that are coming in and forming businesses and they they get the knowledge they need to run the business and they get that self-worth and they get what dame pauline green said doug and i'll shut up and let you talk but they get what she said is that co-ops have people come out of poverty with dignity they get dignity Okay, yeah. so yeah. there's a lot that one can get out of co-ops as people begin to understand this model. If they wanted to get help from NCBA, 
to develop a co-op, to start a co-op, or to try to find a co-op that they might join or purchase from? How would they How would they go about doing that? Well, of course, we have a, a web presence at ncba.coop, and uh, contact information is there. We would love to hear from people, and we'll you know we'd be able to provide some information and and kind of depending on the situation uh we have a, a network of co-op developers that are members of our membership association which NCBA Calusa is or otherwise you know great co-op developers across the country that we refer people to and so please do look us up at ncbaclusa.coop ncba.coop yes sir okay yeah because of course that uh yeah, ncba.coop works and ncbaclusive.coop, both of them work for us. Um, and that identifier, that, that domain of .coop, just going a, a little aside alley here, that domain about 20 years ago or so, NCBAclusive, um, we created that domain. And there's thousands of cooperatives across the world now who use the .coop. And uh, and now we we own half of it in the International Cooperative Alliance, which is the the global association for all co-ops in in the world. They own the other half. And uh, that dot co-op, folks, check check out dot co-op because that that brand it, it really matters, right? I mean, we need to be able to to distinguish our businesses. They're different businesses. They get different outcomes. The way that they engage and support community is different, so we should be telling folks. So you, you bet we're a dot co-op and we're proud of it. <laughs> and we are everything dot C-O-O-P also, so yes, we, <laughs> yes, we have are. that domain. Um, <laughs> I want to go back to something you said because I think it's extremely important, and you said it very quickly, and that is how co-ops function through the great, depression and the great recession of 07, 08, or when there's downturns or when there's issues. So what's the, what is the research says how co-ops function during that, these kinds of turbulent times? Yeah. So the, the, the research says that, that co-op businesses tend to be much more resilient, hard stop, not, you know, period, uh, but especially through those times of, of tumult, like you just said, through uh, the Great Recession, um, I mean, we've got we've been doing some research and in indicating that uh, that through the pandemic, uh, co-ops tended to do a lot better than other businesses. The Credit Union National Association, now the America's Credit Unions, they were able to show that, particularly I think through the Great Recession, that that credit unions served their members and were there through that Great Recession in much more stronger fashion than than others. You know, you, when you look at some of those data points around credit unions and we were talking about before how economic empowerment uh credit unions they charge lower interest rate on loans and they pay better interest rate on savings and the reason they do that is because the people own that credit union and money's not being sucked out of it for outside investors or maybe it's just one owner with one big family with a whole bunch of money that's taking that money it's keeping it in that community on, on that resilience point, because it's owned by people in the community, they're, the way they think about the sustainability of that business, they're not, they're not looking short term. They want that business to be there for the long term. So they make investments for the long term. And, you know, the well-run co-ops, and that's the vast majority of them, they've got reserves to make sure that they can get through a tough time. And then I think that the, perhaps one of the most important ingredients of that magic sauce is that the community, once a, once they establish a co-op, they've got money invested in that business. But maybe more importantly, they've got their own heart and soul and their community, their their social capital is in that business. And they don't want to see that business go away. Uh, and so they'll go an extra mile, whether that means maybe putting a little bit more money into it or having a little more patience about getting money out of it. But but it also might mean making sure that they do business, you know, uh, and uh, patronize they're cooperative in, in another way. So there's, I think there's a lot of reasons, but at the end of the day, co-ops are more resilient and continue to serve communities, and particularly harder to serve, you know, uh, more remote, historically underserved communities. Fantastic. Uh, that resilience is, um, it's awesome. And Dr. Jessica Gordon-Nimhard in her book, Collective Carriage, talks about 
co-opts in the African American community through history, and that's one of the things she talks about was how how these businesses stay in existence even during hard times. Mm-hmm. I'd like to talk. Well, let's just talk a little bit before we go into break about your plans for this October and the yeah. impact. Yeah, give a give a preview of that. We might have a little bit longer. So uh, every October, the first week of October, we have what you know. It's Cooperative Impact Week that NCBA Inclusive uh, is so excited to be with the rest of of the cooperative community here in the United States. We come right here into Washington D.C. and and also we work uh, with the international cooperative development community. And uh, I'm really excited a bit to to talk a little bit more about that. We got some really special things happening in 2024 this October. Fantastic. And look, Doug, we're going to take our first break and come back. I want to talk more about impact and the other things that you're doing. Particularly, I'm interested in where are you traveling to this year in 2024? What are all the kinds of things you're doing both in the U.S. and internationally? And maybe I can go along with you and carry your bags with some of the places that you're, that you're headed out to. <laughs> I don't want you carrying my bags, but I, I would love to have you with me, Vernon. <laughs> We'll be right back. Please don't touch that dial. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the show is Everything Co-op. We're talking to Doug O'Brien, who's the president and CEO of NCBA Clusa. And, Doug, we've been on air a little bit over 10 years now, and the National Co-op Bank has been our main sponsor. NCB's mission is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, especially in low-income communities, by providing innovative financial and related services. Uh, So they have just been a tremendous partner in these 10-plus years as you know, because you were, were when we had an active advisory committee, you were on that committee with the folks at NCBA, at NCB. So, and thank you for that. But I want to get back to your schedule, particularly. Let's go keep talking about October because you have Impact and the ICA board members are coming up for that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about let's talk about October a little bit. So as I mentioned, we, you know, we uh, we help uh, bring together the cooperative community here in the United States and and from around the world, right to Washington D.C. every October, first week of October. This year, uh, we're going to bring leaders, cooperative leaders from uh, across both South and North America. The board, the International Cooperative Alliance of the Americas, will be. In Washington D.C., so there's that's actually almost 50 people who are you know leaders and young people and and thinkers. There's there's so many interesting and important things to learn from our neighbors uh, to the south and north, and uh, and so we're really excited that they're going to be here. We partner with the Overseas Cooperative Development Organization every year. OCDC. Uh, one of the days of co-op, we partner together to, to focus on international cooperative development. And uh, and so those are the cooperative development organizations here in the United States who do international work. So we bring together some of the best examples and best thinkers of, of how we're doing uh, co-op development overseas. And then the week always culminates in, in what for me is always a big, huge highlight, and that's the Cooperative Hall of Fame. So the Cooperative Development Foundation is celebrating uh, a couple of big milestones this year. They, the CDF is, is our affiliated uh, nonprofit, 501c3, and they've been around now for 80 years. And for 50 of those years, they've curated and um, kind of taken care of the Cooperative Hall of Fame, the, the co-op heroes. And every year, four or five people are inducted into the Hall of Fame. And you talk about the special people in the co-op community these are these are sort of some of the the most special i guess i'd say and 
I'm really excited this year because uh, the person I'm talking to right now uh, is being inducted into the Hall of Fame, which is so fantastic. It is really fantastic and a, a tremendous honor that uh, a committee of five people got together and did the application to nominate me. And a couple of those went into the room for the selection and I was selected and that was just fascinating. And I knew nothing about it. Okay. <laughs> so they... They surprised me, and that induction in, into the Hall of Fame will happen October the 3rd. So okay. I'm really looking forward to that. That's yeah. wonderful. And also, there's something that was started three years ago, this Unsung Heroes. Yeah. And that first year was Ella Jo Baker. Yeah. And the second year was Helena Wilcox. And right. this year is Nanny Helen Burroughs, right here from right. D.C., that yeah. are cooperators and have been cooperators, and they just were unsung heroes, and they're getting recognized now for their yeah. contribution. So that's fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. It's been a great that's that's been that's been such a great addition to the Hall of Fame. I think because the way you know it, it some of those folks for lots of reasons uh, over the years they had been overlooked, and they are some of the the great pioneers and champions and heroes of the cooperative movement here in the United States. So, yeah, that's awesome. What was fascinating to me, one of the things was a lot, but Ella Jo Baker got early training about community development from NCBA CLUSA, yeah. <laughs> from what was called CLUSA at the time. CLUSA then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we were CLUSA up until 1985. Yeah, you know, to that, that point, I want to come back to one other point about, about, uh, about the October week, but I – but that just surfaces in Dr. Uh, Gordon Emhart's book that you referred to, Collective Courage. One of the great takeaways that I took away from it was how many of the civil rights leaders of the late 50s and 60s, they actually were trained in community organizing with cooperative development in the 30s and 40s. So it was, it was, that, it was that push during the, the New Deal that had resources and focus on cooperative development and it, it trained a lot of people at that time. And then, you know, when the, when the time came and the people uh, stepped forward, they had those, that skill set that yeah. came from co-ops and they brought it in. Yeah. It's, it's just an amazing thing. And one other thing I want to mention about, about Co-op Week is that, I, you know, we, we, we've got the Hall of Fame, which is fantastic. And, and the folks that are inducted in the Hall of Fame, almost by definition, they're, they're seasoned cooperative leaders. We also have the cooperatives and leaders and scholars. So these are emerging leaders who are very much part of the entire cooperative week. So they're people uh, from the United States. And, and last year, we had nearly 40 people with uh, maybe a, a third of those folks from across the world. So we're able to bring emerging leaders from different continents with the cooperative community here in the United States, you know, to hopefully enrich them. But certainly to enrich us with their with their passion and uh and their vision so if you hadn't brought that up i was because that's my that's my favorite part of of yeah. the impact is talking to these young people and we interview them whatever thursday that it might be in this week there they articulate the co-op values and principles and benefits so extremely well and they, you said passion i was going to say they're, they're excited and it joyful it it is awesome and so I, I really appreciate that now if somebody is a young person in the co-op world and they want to be a part of it how will they go about getting the information about the young scholars program the best place so so that's that's another program that the cooperative development foundation really drives and so if you went to um, cdf.coop and then you can you, you could find the information for the cooperative leaders and scholars right there um, so that's cdf.coop. That's the Young Scholars Program. And there are some scholarships available for that. So if you wanted to come and get great training and meet other young people that are in this co op world, and I don't know if it's from 18 to 35, but it's a pretty large range when I look at the people that, that we've talked to. Uh, in the Young Scholars Program. 
Yeah, yeah, and that 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 you're you're right. It, it you know the focus and the eligibility. You can look it up, and it is at cdf.coop slash cls. And it's folks who are who are relatively new to the cooperative community, kind of no matter their age. Um, so if, if if they're coming into the cooperative community, and it you know it could be a second career, or they're uh, uh, they're you know a, a, a late blooming student kind of thing, that they're also eligible. And yes, there's scholarships. You know, with with thanks to to the cooperative community in the U.S. nationwide and some others who provide the resources to make sure that that these folks can come and be part of CLS. So I understand you have a suitcase that you keep packed because you, in the U.S. you're going around something called round tables or something. What is that about? Yeah. What are you doing there? Yeah, yeah. We're so. Um, we are going to um, meet the cooperative community just where they are this year. We're going to we're going to be at a number of cooperative policy roundtables. You know, a, a, an extended conversation with co-op leaders in the state or in the region about their policy and advocacy priorities and about strategies on how we can make sure that these priorities be- become real. You know, become law. Uh, so at the end of the month, I'm going to be in Montana in Great Falls with folks at the Montana Cooperative oh, Development Center. Oh, uh, that's cold up there. If it could be chilly, <laughs> that's hey, chilly, yes, yeah. that's where they are. So that's where we go. And uh, uh, there's a great a great team there at, at MCDC and, and folks. So looking forward to being there. And we'll be in North Carolina. We're going to do one in Madison. Uh, we'll do one with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, and you know, in either in Alabama or Georgia, most likely. Uh, looking at doing one uh, farther out west, and so, and we're going to do some of these virtual as well. Uh, you know, that's that's the only way. It's kind of in that in that cooperative spirit of of uh, you know, how does how would NCBA Clusa make sure that it it's carrying the voice of of the cooperative community to Capitol Hill to the federal agencies in a way most effective. The only way that we can be effective is if if we really get the benefit of the knowledge and the priorities of the cooperative communities. So we're going to go out and talk to them. So what federal organizations do you work with? The, so the federal organizations we work with within the federal agencies, mm-hmm. uh, is that what you're mm-hmm. asking? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture is sort of the legacy cooperative agency. Uh, so they they actually have a, a program within one of their agencies called Cooperative Services, and, and they're one of our main partners. And that, that agency is tasked with uh, bringing – other federal agencies into the cooperative conversation with a working group. And so we work a lot with the USDA. We also work a lot with uh, the Small Business Administration, which in its loan programs are, are really challenging for cooperatives because of the way they're administered and some of the rules. So we've been working for years with the cooperative community to get that changed at SBA uh, because there's such an that is SBA is such an important agency for for co-ops uh, to be able to access capital we work with the uh, with HUD with the Housing Urban Development Agency to make sure that uh, you know that that its programs are working for co-op housing uh, the Department of Labor these days has a lot more interest in worker cooperatives so uh, so we're engaging with them uh, you know, usually hand in hand with the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops and, and others. So, you know, there's so much that goes on in the federal government that there's a lot of opportunity for cooperatives. And we see our task is to make sure that, that we can match that, those opportunities and those federal agencies understand that cooperatives can really help them meet their mission. Wow. I didn't know about the Department of Labor. I knew about the other three. Um, and the Department of Agriculture being sort of the main one because the farmers have been using co-ops since the beginning of time, it seems. The Small Business Administration, I understand that the Fredericksburg Food Co-op got the first loan from SBA for a co-op. And normally they wouldn't make the loan because they're looking for an individual to sign. And this is owned by the group. Okay. Right. And some of these worker co-ops, the group members may be resourced challenge okay mm-hmm. <laughs> have no assets so it, it gets to be difficult and so i'm glad you're working with them and working through that that's that's can make things a lot brighter because money turns out to be an, an issue for any business that's getting started no matter what yeah. it is okay so let's talk a little bit about where you're traveling internationally 
Yeah. 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 Well, uh, let's see. I'm going to head down to Columbia uh, for the International Cooperative Alliance board meeting in late February. Uh, mentioned, I mentioned the ICA before. That's the, uh, that's the, the global organization for all kinds of cooperatives, you know, really a manifestation of the six cooperative principle of cooperatives cooperating. And, um, so I'll be there. I also am planning the, the ICA is having a world congress or a, actually a general assembly in New Delhi, India, uh, toward the end of November. So I'm looking forward to attending that most likely. And while I'm there, I will visit some of the programs that NCBA CLUSA works with in Southeast Asia, in East Timor. Uh, and uh, we've been there for nearly 40 years in that region, helping farmers with, uh, you know, form cooperatives to, to capture value around vanilla, around coffee. And so, you know, I'll, I'll probably be in that part of the world as well. So, oh, I really uh, want to go with you to India. Okay. I, I went, okay. I went right. once. Let's go, was, Vernon. Let's go. Pack it, your bag. It was the late 70s, so I really want to go back. Okay. Yeah. And what about Puerto Rico? When are you going there? Well, you asked about international travel, and that's U.S. travel. So I'm heading <laughs> down to Puerto Rico uh, with – really excited about this trip in just, in just uh, oh, less than a month, a few weeks. The, the board of NCBA Clusa will be going down to Puerto Rico to spend time with – with our counterparts, the La Liga Co Cooperativas um, in uh, in Puerto Rico, to learn more about the cooperative community there, how we can work together more effectively, and with uh, a, a project that NCBA Clusa is is working on with coffee farmers in Puerto Rico. Coffee farmers tend to be they tend to be very small farmers and who have really relatively very low you know household income, and uh, and we're working with the U.S. Department of Agriculture on a program called Climate Smart Commodities. So it's helping these farmers become more resilient and more economically successful in the face of climate change. And, you know, what does that mean? That means helping them uh, plant, uh, you know, there's going to be, our goal is to work with about 2,000 farmers and they're going to be planting 2 million trees. Uh, so coffee trees, but also other trees that, that build the ecosystem for more resilience you know, in a in a climate change uh, type of environment, uh, and then also helping those farmers capture more value in the in the marketing value chain. So we're really excited about that work in Puerto Rico, where where the co op system in certain sectors is really strong. Uh, worker co ops have really taken hold in Puerto Rico. Credit unions, particularly the community development financial institution, credit unions are are a really major force in Puerto Rico. Uh, so we we look forward to being there and, and learning. From that part of the United States that really has a unique story and and has a lot for us in the U.S. cooperative community to learn about how to how to build a more inclusive economy because they have a history of, of exploitation of colonialism and they've used co-ops uh, to you know to really be resilient in the face of, of some of those historic challenges. So I know Puerto Rico is a part of the U.S. I lived there for five years. <laughs> but the culture is so different. I still put it yes, yes. international. It's they, yeah. they, you know, the the um, Spanish Latin culture is still so different. And when you go there, uh, I was told by a cooperator in Puerto Rico that they've had co-ops in schools for the last sixty years. Huh. And for that particular year, they had fifty-four active co-ops from elementary school through college. I had them on a show first, and then I went to a conference, and they showed a chart of elementary school kids running a board meeting. And I go, when you start talking about teaching kids, okay, uh, how to speak and uh, the finances and the mathematics and the logic flow, running a business is critical, and then the co-op, how you work together. How do you solve... Yeah. How do you solve when there's, you know, when two or more are together, you're going to have conflict and disagreements. So how do you solve those conflict in a meaningful, positive way so you can take advantage of the different points of view and move forward? So, yeah, it's, when you're down there, I won't be able to go this soon, but uh, if you could try to see what, how many co-ops do they have in the schools there, and maybe we can bring that back and get co-ops operating in schools here. Great. Also, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhart says they have co-ops in, in uh, penitentiaries down there, in the jails. 
Yeah, I've just I've, I've been trying to do some reading. Some folks have been giving some good suggestions on on how to read up, and and something I read earlier this week. I think Puerto Rico was was perhaps the first place that used the co-op business model um, for for returning citizens. And of course, uh, Dr. Gordon Imhart now is that's one of the focus of her works, the, the, including a, a number of other people, of, of really looking at how people who are returning from you know certain time that they they can you know be economically stable and uh and successful uh upon their upon their return into into society including that dignity okay absolutely yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. 2025 the un is going to call that the international year that's right so in november the general assembly of the united nations uh, adopted a resolution that 2025 would be the international year of the co-op for co-op veterans listening right now, they will remember 2012 was also an international year of the co-op. We're really excited about this. It provides a platform and an opportunity for for co-ops across the country and co-ops across the world to really lift up how cooperatives can help get better outcomes. And and from the UN's perspective, I think they're they're focused on those uh, the social development goals, the 17 SDGs. You know, so that there's no more people who are impoverished, um, dealing with goals around food insecurity, around education and health, as well as other social development goals. It's going to give us an opportunity in 2025 to really show the world how co-ops are, you know, the preferred strategy to get these better outcomes uh, of the SDGs. So we're, we're really excited about 2025 and, and working with the global cooperative community. And Vernon, you're going you're gonna to have to get involved with this. Well, in 2011, I went to the to UN. It was about, I don't know, 100, 150 of us that went to the UN, and it was from all over the world. I was That was my first introduction to all of the things that's happening in the world. And... Um, because at the time I was president of the National Association of Housing Co-ops, so I went to the UN, uh, and it was just phenomenal. So the question is, what are we going to do this year to prepare for 2025? And right. I say we. What are we going to do? Yeah. So, so, so the, the the global we, right? And I, I'll mention I'm 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 excited that from from Puerto Rico, the day after I'm with the board of NCBA Clusa, I'm, I'm, I'll be in New York on a panel with the UN Commission for Social Development talking about your question. You know, what are we going to do in 2024 to prepare? And, you know, one thing I think that we're, we're certainly can and should do is organize how we talk about the impact of cooperatives. So there, there's a lot of cooperatives and cooperative associations that do that do great reports, whether they're called impact reports or it's a part of their annual report or maybe it's a set-aside report. That talks about the, you know, the thousands of people that they help, the the way that they increase income, the way that they get better, you know, job satisfaction, et cetera. So we want to, I think we want to start thinking about how do we bring all that together, you know, to make sure that there's a really clear through line so that people can see what a difference that cooperatives make. Yes. Awesome. And that's the, the we I'd like to be a part of that because that impact is so great. And too often I find that cooperators would do the study and they'll talk about it to themselves and maybe their next neighbor the cooperator, but it doesn't get out into the world. Right. So how do we get all of that information out of the impact of co-ops to everyday people, quality of life, wealth, financial wealth, social wealth, and self-worth, self-wealth. Okay. You have a very, very busy year coming up. You've got it planned out. If you just go down your traveling, uh, both in the U.S. and international, and then all of these different programs, do you have time for your family? I, I, I most certainly do. So I got, I have, uh, they're the most important thing. I mean, I love cooperatives in the cooperative community, but at, at, uh, at the end of the day, uh, there isn't a cooperative in the kitchen when I walk in. It's it's, uh, <laughs> it's my partner and my kids. Uh, yeah, it, it, I, uh, I, got, I got three kids from 14 to, to nine years old. And my, my wife, Alicia, 
they get to be on this cooperative journey with me as well. You're talking about co-ops in schools. So all three of my kids went to what we call in the house co-op camp. So the Wisconsin Farmers Union, um, and the, the Farmers Union, a general farm organization uh, here in the United States, they have co-ops as as one of the corners of their triangle. They have advocacy, education, and cooperation. And in the Wisconsin Association that I'm a member of, proudly, they have a camp every year. Uh, that's kind of sort of a typical summer camp up in a lake at Chippewa Falls, and they have a co-op, not only a co-op curriculum, but the kids, the, the, the canteen, the store, is it's a consumer co-op. Okay. So, uh, so, the, so in, in, in that four days, they elect the board, they've got subcommittees, uh, and they get a patronage at the end. So if they spend $10 buying some what we call in the Midwest some pop and some candy bars, uh, <laughs> they get a little bit of that back. And so, uh, so around the dinner table, when I'm talking about cooperatives, the kids, uh, the kids know what I'm talking about, which is pretty cool. <laughs> That's real cool. In the last minute, uh, Doug, what's the message you'd like to leave people with? Well, in 2024, co-ops are as relevant as they ever have been. Uh, you know, we're facing some challenges around inequality, around climate, around the changing nature of technology and what it means to people's work. Co-ops are a proven strategy to empower people in this economy and to empower them in society. So we need to work together. We need we need principle six to make sure that more people understand and can use cooperatives to build a more inclusive economy. And principle six is cooperation among co-ops. And everybody out there, we'll be back next Thursday. And we would like for you to live cooperatively, which means that we're working together, taking on things together, working together, solving problems together. Thank you very much, Doug, for being on today. All right.